In this video, we're going to review some MATLAB basics. This MATLAB script contains four parts. Part 1 covers vectors, part 2 covers matrices, part 3 covers indexing, and part 4 covers plotting. Let's get started with part 1. Vectors and matrices are crucial in MATLAB. They are the foundation of the entire programming language and we will use them extensively throughout the semester. It's important to become well-versed in vector and matrix operations, especially once we cover topics such as linear algebra and differential equations. Let's review how to make vectors using the colon operator and the linspace command. For the colon operator, we'll need to specify a start point, the increment size, and the end point. Let's make a variable called a underscore colon and have it go from 0 to 10 in increments of 2. Add a semicolon to suppress the output if you want. One subtlety of the colon operator here is your vector is not guaranteed to contain your endpoint. Let's make another vector called a colon 2. Upon running the code, we see that the last entry in this vector is 15, not 17. This is because the endpoint doesn't divide evenly into the start point and increment. Starting at 0 and going up by 3 won't get you exactly to 17, so MATLAB made the vector stop at 15 because that's the closest number to 17 without going over. Although this can kind of seem like a deal breaker, it's really not that big of an issue. I've never personally had problems with it, especially in this class. There's another way to create vectors, and that's by using the linspace command. Linspace requires three inputs, or arguments. The first input is the start point, the second is the end point, and the third is the number of points in the vector. Let's duplicate a underscore colon using the linspace command. We'll call it a underscore linspace. This says we want to create a vector that starts at 0, ends at 10, and has 6 equally spaced points in between. I'm not the biggest fan of linspace because choosing the number of points can be kind of counterintuitive, but one upside is that your vector is always guaranteed to contain the start and end points. It doesn't truncate values early like the colon operator can. So you have two ways of creating vectors. My suggestion is to pick and choose whichever method you like, then stick with it for the rest of the class. Alright, moving on to part 2, which deals with matrices. Vectors are one-dimensional, but matrices are multi-dimensional. You can think of a matrix as a bunch of concatenated, or stacked, vectors. For instance, consider this matrix. The magic command creates a square matrix, in this case a 3x3 matrix, with equal row and column sums. If you add each row, column, or diagonal, you'll get the same sum, which is 15 in this case. It's actually pretty cool. We can break this matrix into three row vectors. And we can reassemble matrix 1 from these three vectors. This is called vertical concatenation since we're vertically stacking vectors. Note the use of semicolons here and here to denote separate rows. We can follow a similar process by horizontally concatenating column vectors as well. What if we wanted to break up a matrix into its constituent vectors? We can use the colon operator to extract entire rows or columns. Let's break up matrix 1 into three row vectors. As you can see, the colon operator has many uses. In part 1, we used it to create vectors, and in this part, we used it to extract vectors. I like to read this statement as all the columns in row 1, and this statement would be all the columns in row 2, and this one would be all the columns in row 3. 
Row 1 to row 3 are identical to VEC1 to VEC3, as expected. When used in this way, the colon operator is really powerful because you can access an entire row or column regardless of how big the matrix is. This is useful if you don't know the exact size of the matrix, which can actually happen a lot more than you think. Okay, time for part 3. Another extremely valuable tool is learning how to extract values from vectors or matrices. This is formerly known as indexing or addressing. You'll probably hear both used interchangeably. We'll cover this in more depth in the coming classes, but let's review the basics. I'm going to create another vector v equals 1 to 3 to 20. If we want to pull the third element from v, we use index notation. Hopefully this is pretty straightforward. One nuance is that MATLAB starts counting indices at 1. In Java and C++ and some other languages, the counting usually begins at 0. Don't do this in MATLAB, you'll get an error because you're basically trying to say that you want to extract the zero with element from the vector, which obviously doesn't exist. And you can see that we get the error, so always make sure you're not confusing yourself with another programming language. To pull a single element from a matrix, we need two indices, one for the row and one for the column. And this gives us the element of M located in the second row and fifth column. Again, we can use the colon operator to extract a range of elements. Here, we're extracting the second through sixth elements of V. Here, we're extracting the elements in the first three rows of column 5 in M. Here, we're extracting the elements in columns 2 through 4 of row 1 in M. And here are some even more clever uses for the colon operator. This extracts every other element ending at the penultimate entry, which is denoted by the end minus 1. We're putting elements 5 through 7 before elements 1 to 4, so we're essentially swapping elements 1 to 4 with elements 5 to 7. This reverses the order of V. Notice how we start with the end keyword, increment our new vector by negative 1, and end at 1. This one's a bit different because we're using the colon operator on the left side of the equal sign. What this means is that we're taking elements 2 through 4 of the original vector v and replacing whatever values they currently have with these three values on the right hand side. These are just a few examples of the many uses of the colon operator. Many problems in this class can be solved or greatly simplified via clever vector or matrix indexing, so practice this as much as you can. Finally, let's do some plotting. Most problems will involve obtaining and manipulating data through vectors, then plotting the results so you can visually see what's happening in the system. Let's plot sine and cosine versus time. First, we need to define the time vector. So our t vector goes from 0 to 3 pi in increments of 0 0.1. Whenever you plot, Make sure your step size is small enough such that the plot doesn't look jagged. This usually involves some experimentation. Next, we need our sine and cosine vectors. For the sake of time, I already wrote out the code to plot the functions and annotate the graph, so uncomment the code and run it. In the plot command, I have this gv in apostrophes, which means to plot the sine function using green triangles, g for green and v for triangles. 
and I did something similar in the cosine function. You can read more about colors, line styles, and line widths in MATLAB's documentation. The hold on command forces MATLAB to plot everything in the same plot. We can add a grid using the grid on command. Hopefully this all looks pretty familiar, but you probably haven't seen X ticks or X ticks labels before. These just make the x-axis look tidy since it's nice to see multiples of pi along the axis. Don't forget a title, axis labels, and a legend. Plotting is an essential tool which you'll use extensively, so be sure to get comfortable with it. And that's it for the first demo. I hope this helps you on your workshop.